for now. Okay, so let's go into the Word. Where are we uh, uh, in the Torah? We're almost to the end, right? Uh, where am I here? And almost completing our Torah cycle. And in this occasion, it's going to be a double portion. Parashot Nitzavim Ve'ahelik. So, anybody know what Nitzavim is? It's not a trick. It's actually how it started in Kiro Redent. It means when you are standing, right? And then the other one is when you what? Come. Oh, oh, okay. Deuteronomy 29 through 31, 30. We're going to be covering a little bit on 29 and a little bit on 31 today. There is uh, obviously the Isaiah Chapter 61 in Romans and also the reference in Luke that was read earlier. There's a lot of material to go here. We're just going to be able to cover just a few points. This is what the outline looks like. The outline. First and foremost, we, Moshe is reestablishing the covenant with the next generation of the uh, people of Israel. The restoration of Hashem through repentance, the Torah how accessible it is. Uh, he encourages the people uh, the reading of the law during the seventh year cycle of Sukkot and the writing of the law completes um, this parashot in uh, chapter 31. First, briefly, let's look at what we went over last week. If you were here or if you joined us last week, we talked about that all the covenants are conditional. Regardless of the covenant, they're going to have a certain kind of condition. And most people think, oh, well, in Messiah, there is no condition. It says, yes, there is a condition. Unless you believe that Messiah, Yeshua, is the Messiah of Israel and their Savior, you're not saved. So there's a condition right there. So all of them are conditional. We talked about the principle of first fruits, the reshit, as uh, spoken about in the uh, last Torah portion, and the importance of it. And how is it applied not only back in the Torah times, how is it applied today? We spoke and read Matthew 6, and we talked about that that's the example of how to live a righteous life. And it should be a reminder for us that every once in a while, if we want to be reminded to go back and read Matthew 6 and how to live a righteous life. And then we talked about the concept of the maaser or the tithes. Maaser Rishon, Sheni, and Ani, the first, second, and third type of tithes. That was last week. Now this week, or today, as you see in this slide, we're going to be going into our next Torah, uh, two parashots. And Moshe is getting here down to the end, and he knows it. He's like a like hours left in his life. He sees the land. He sees everything is taking place. That people are getting ready to go and conquer the land. And he knows he can't go in. So he is ramping up. Telling the people what they should do. And what should they expect. So. With Moshe addressing all of Israel. At the very last part of last week's Torah portion. In verse 69 of chapter 28, there is a particular statement that uh, Moshe told the people. So if you go to verse 69 of chapter 28 in the last world portion, it reads, These are the terms of the covenant which the Lord commanded Moshe to conclude with the Israelites in the land of Moab, in addition to the covenant which he had made with them at Horeb. Hold it. How many covenants are they? Is this taken care or is the other one voided, which is what you sometimes run into? They said, oh, I don't have to do the Torah anymore. That is the old covenant. Right? You heard that. Get rid of that phrase. For us old people, we don't like that phrase. <laughs> no. <laughs> old covenant. Get rid of the old covenant thing. It says the covenant of Moshe. Is this still viable today? 
Absolutely. So it's not old. It's not voided. So covenants, as we have spoken before, are both conditional, but they are built upon each other. They're not voided. They're not gotten rid of just because another one comes into play. They actually build upon each other. Hello? <laughs> oh, it's... <laughs> So, Moshe, in order to establish this covenant, calls all the people of Israel. And he goes ahead and states that on that day, as you see here, Aten Nitzavim Hayom, today, in red, you see there. I think I covered this once before, in which the emphasis is made on today. There's no time to, like today. You know, some people say, you know, you got an opportunity to do this. Here's the typical answer. Let me pray about it, brother. Get rid of that and go to the next one. Would you do this for Hashem today? See? People have a tendency to fall into that trap. Let me pray about it, brother. Actions. Attempt today. He needs them to pay attention today, not tomorrow, not when they feel like it. Because he's about to ratify Hashem's covenant with them. He says, you stand this day, all of you, before the Lord your God, your tribal heads, your elders, your officials, all the men of Israel, your children, your wives, even the stranger within your camp, the woodchopper, the water drawer, to enter into the covenant of the Lord your God, which the Lord your God is concluding with you. When? Today. It says, with his sanctions to the end that he might establish you. When? Today. And his people and be your God. And he promised you as he has sworn to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Yaakov. So, if Moshe... It's bringing such an emphasis to this. It must be this. It's very important. You see, the last time we will see them all together, all the children of Israel together, is right here in the Transjordan area. Why? They're about to enter the land, but there's two and a half tribes that are going to say, oh, we're not going. Right? We're not going. Who are they? Reuben. Gap and half of the tribe of Man uh, Manasseh, right? So this is the last time he's able to put them all together, and all together they got to agree that this is the way they have to conduct themselves. This is the ratification of the covenant given to their forefathers. At this point, the people, you think they might have been scared? They, at this point, they have heard more than 147 curses. If they don't obey Hashem. If they disobey, at this point they have heard it from both mountains. They have heard all that Hashem is like, these are the instructions. You either have blessings or you have curses. Most of us like to only hear the blessing part in our nature. And we think that through our disobedience we're still going to harvest the blessings. Only through God's mercy we receive the mercy despite our own shortfalls. Through Messiah, Yeshua, who paid the ultimate price for us, right? So, Moshe is careful here. And he puts them in order. A very interesting order. It says tribal leaders, elders, officers. Then all the men of Israel followed by the children, the women, the gerim, and the kam. Right? As you see, the, uh, the ones in green here is the order. Shevitechem, Sekinem, the elders, Veshterachem. All this order is for a purpose. Because the very top, they're what? Leaders over hundreds or even thousands. So you have a responsibility. And you need to take attention today. Because after you, here comes the other ones. And those are accountable to you and to me. See? 
So he takes them, he puts them in order, but he never forgets every single individual there. Everyone needed to be accounted for. They all needed to be reassured that they were standing before Hashem. Just like it says up here in the Aron Kodesh. Behold in whom you've been standing under. That's what that means, that phrase up there. You're standing before Hashem. So if you can't stand before Hashem and acknowledge His greatness and they said, I am going to do what I say I'm going to do, what do you think is going to happen if you don't? It's like, you know, growing up, they used to tell me, well, you know, don't swear. Don't make a promise you can't keep. You didn't remember that? Don't make a promise you can't keep. They say, well, I got news for you. You don't have to do the pinky thing. You don't have to do the cross your heart. All you have to say is, yes, I will do it. And there it is. You got a commitment. See, but that's been watered down. That's been watered down to, yes, maybe I will do it. If I have time, well, I'll do it. If it's convenient, I will do it. Isn't that the truth? And then the people are waiting there. What happened? Well, I didn't have time. I couldn't do it. See? It's a commitment. So, when he's got him in this position here, he said, listen, I'm putting you before Hashem. Are you going to make a commitment here and reestablish this covenant with him and do as he has asked you to do? Moshe was exhorting them that they were going to get into the land and they were going to have resistance. And he's telling them, you better endure. So he's telling you, hey, you're here in this pandemonium, are you going to endure? You're here and you are going to have to endure joblessness, persecution, people that don't like you. Are you going to endure? If your answer is yes, then he ratifies that covenant with you. If your answer is a maybe, then the expectation should be that, oops, maybe I should go back in the right side of the commitment. In other words, Hazal teaches, our sages teach it, that here in the Torah, Moshe is telling the people, you will suffer tribulation. But just as salt, you know, the covenant of salt, we're talking about covenant here, just like salt preserves meat, and allows me to endure, so too, tribulation will help you endure. Do you realize that? That's taught by the sages. So most of us say, hey, you know what? I just want to get on the spaceship and get out of here before the tribulation comes. <laughs> hey, I'm not laughing. I was in that crowd. I said, I'm leaving. You know, we got all kinds of different songs for that. No, all these different songs that we were going to leave and we were going to suffer nothing. All I had to do is be a, a good boy and I have nothing to worry about. But that's not what the Word says. That's not what the Word says. That's not what Messiah said. The term here that you see here is very interesting. The term ger, gerim, stranger in the parashat Netzavim. It implies that standing proudly in attention, all of them, all of Israel, along with the women, the children, and the stranger. Wonder who that stranger is? It's you and I. One part of the commonwealth of Israel, right? Implying that not only are they standing there, they are acknowledging, standing before the captain of the host. You know what that implies? It implies army terms. And then we're talking about the commander in chief. Hashem. And you're standing before him in attention as his armies, a host, and you're included. 
the Gerim is included. Right there you find it in the Torah. It didn't magically appear after the little white page in, in Matthew. It has been there all along here from the Torah. Okay? So you stand there with dignity. Like a soldier of the Almighty, Hashem. Ready to fight the good fight. So if you're going to fight the good fight, there's got to be a fight. It can't be all smelling roses and like nothing. It's just going to be given to me. The Baal Shem Tov told that these words found here, standing today, is a reference actually to the time we're about to celebrate, Rosh Hashanah, in a week. Why? Because it speaks about a day. There will be a day that we all be before Hashem. Isn't that what Rosh Hashanah is? It will be the sound of the great trumpet. It's referred to that day of great judgment, Yom Hadin in Hebrew. It's another name for Rosh Hashanah. Most people think, oh, so it's just uh, the head of the year. Okay, great. Oh, or it's uh, the trumpet. We all disappear. It's also known as Yom Hadin, a day of great judgment. You better be in the army of the captain of the host. On that day. It says here. On that day the shofar blast will be heard as a reminder of what? Of this covenant. And a call for repentance is also the time the Messiah will gather his people. Moshe in this Torah portion is letting the people know that they will be others in the future. We read that. There will be others just like them that will be standing taking on this covenant. So in a sense, what Moshe is saying here is totally messianic and is totally speaking about the future. They're standing there today, but it's like we are standing as well with them, knowing that in the future, Messiah will come in and gather his people on that day, designated day. Okay? You and I were accounted here as being part of those who will stand and join the Jewish people in this covenant and be able to enter the land. That's the Messianic kingdom to come. So these are the nations together with Israel that would also participate with Yeshua the Messiah and pay the ransom for all the generations to come, Jew and non-Jew, who will come in Him, in Messiah, through faith in Messiah, into His kingdom, into the Lamb. That's your promise. And that's what he is saying that he will give you. He didn't say he was going to disappear you, and he didn't say you will not suffer. But he gave you the assurance of where you're going to end up. You must endure. It's hard when people don't realize that people lose faith because of their circumstances. But that's the essence of what faith is. Hebrews, right? The book of Hebrews tells you, you must have faith in things that are not seen, but they are promised. So in order for you to bring them into pass in your life, you have to be able to endure. <clears throat> the passages here and in chapter 29 go on to describe the outcome of those who will forsake the words of Moshe and the covenant for which they have ratified with their lives. I'm going to tell you something. Over the last week, as everybody had, you know, during this week, you heard Kelly going through some issues this week, had problems this week. Yes? Yeah? Well, join the club, right? You heard, you heard her testimony, right? So during this week, I felt like I was going out to work and doing all this stuff. But I was doing it then, like angry. You know what I mean, angry? I'm just going out there angry. Anybody? Oh, it looks like I was uh, part of a crowd. See? See? Well, there's hope for us. <laughs> I guess I was angry out there, all, all the time angry. Say, so my wife will say something. Okay, I'm angry, oh, but I'm, it's not a her, it's just something else. See? And anything, it was like that thing. I said, I, I 
message and what's going on? You know, why do I have to go through this? Is it me only? You know, and now I can see this more than me. So let me, let me read here what it says in, 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 in verse uh, 17. And maybe you understand. It says, so let there not be among you a man, woman, family, or tribe whose heart turns away today from Adonai, our God, to go and serve other gods of those nations. And let there not be among you, uh, you a root bearing such bitter poison and wormwood. If there is such a person, when he hears the words of this curse, he will bless himself secretly, saying to himself, I will be all right, even though I will stubbornly keep doing whatever I feel like doing. So that, although, <laughs> although dry, sinful, will be added to the water righteous. But here's the kicker, verse 20. But Adonai will not forgive him. You know, Adonai will not forgive our stubbornness. It says here, rather, the punchline, the anger and jealousy of Adonai will blaze about against that person. Every curse written in this book will be upon him. Adonai will blot out their name from under the heaven. Adonai will single him out from all the tribes of Israel to experience what is bad and all the curses of the covenant written in the book of the Torah. And it goes on to say in verse 29, For this reason, the anger of Adonai blazed against this land and brought upon every curse written in this book. And Adonai in anger, fury, and incense with indignation uprooted them from their land and threw them out into another land as it is today. And when I read that, I said, there it is. There's my anger. I'm angry at the nonsense. I'm angry at the lying. I'm angry at the blindfolds of people. And that has me angry. But you know what? And he says, I have to give him thanks, give him praise, and then preach the truth of the gospel. Because only in it they can have deliverance. It's not up to me. It's the work of the Ruach, obviously. But you know what? I have the right to have righteous indignation if I'm walking in his righteousness. Do you know that? This is what Yeshua did when he walked into the temple. He was righteously, what? Indignant to the way they were using his tithe. They were robbing people. And you don't realize out there there's many people that are robbing, including your thoughts, including your money, including your life, including your children. The poison that it talks about here, they're putting into them. So that's what I was angry. And you know, when I come to him and I, 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 and I start crying for God to have mercy. Mercy on us. Because I read what it says here on the Torah. His fury. But then there's Rosh Hashanah. Yom Hadin. The judgment. So you as believers, we as believers, have to realize that there will be a day when all of that will be paid in full. Hallelujah. In full. You and I have to do our very best to do what's righteous, regardless of the persecution. And that's the rough one. Regardless of what your pal over there or your family members think is right. In this Torah portion, it says, you better choose right. Not, and choose it right now, it says here today. Because you'll be put in that spot. It says here. I believe there are things that are working and trying and the key word here is trying, okay? They're trying to destroy everything you and I believe in. That's the spirit of the anti-Messiah. But there is a verse here in this Torah portion that I frequently use. I frequently use, not only to remind myself, to remind others. 
That's verse 29. And it reads, Things which are hidden belong to Adonai our God. Things that are hidden belong to Adonai our God. But the things that have been revealed belong to us and our children forever so that we can observe all the words of this Torah. So, Stop trying to figure out how many atoms are in the universe and why we act the way we act. That's not revealed in the Torah. Deuteronomy 29, 29. Start applying what it does say and put that into action into your life and trust in Him. That is more difficult, but it's doable. It's what it asks you to do. The question is, how do we remedy this situation? Yes, of course, we follow the Torah and we follow his instructions. But how can we escape such great judgment from the Mighty One? Simple. It's in the Word. It's a key word here. It's in this Torah portion also. Repentance. You see, there is no shortcuts or magic potion or strange recipe that you can come up with in order to find redemption. And right here in Devarim chapter 30, you'll find the profound messianic prophecies about redemption. Not in the Gospels. You see, I'm going to repeat that. Right here in the Torah of Moshe, you find the plan of Hashem's redemption for His people. Spoken by Moshe. Not only for what I said in the previous slide for today, but He said for those who are not here today, for those who will come. He's speaking for their day. That final redemption is what I'm talking about. It says, and it shall come to pass when all these things are come upon thee, the bracha and the kelala, the blessings and the curses which I have set before you, and thou shalt cause them to what? Return. Return is the word for the word shuva, right? Shuva. That's why I call the yeshiva shuvu. Shuva, right? To what? The heart among all the going, all the, nation, all the nations, whether Hashem Elohecha, or your God, has driven thee. He wants them to return, to make shuva, which is a key word here for repentance. Let's move on. Oh, again, and shall return unto Hashem Elohecha, and shall obey his voice according to all that I command thee. When? Today. Thou and thy sons, bekol levacha bekol nafshecha. What does that mean? With all your and with all your being, with all your heart and with all your being. In other words, hey, today you need to repent. Don't wait for tomorrow. Tomorrow might be too late. Tomorrow might be yom hadin, and it's over. Obey his voice, obey his commandments, all of you, but you have to be sincere with all your heart and being. It says that then Hashem Elohecha, your God, will bring you back from what? The Galut, from the exile. Exile is a picture of what? Separation from Hashem. Exile is a picture of being lost. He will bring you from exile and have compassion upon thee. <laughs> Compassion upon thee, and will return and gather thee from Kol Hamim, from all the peoples, whether he has dispersed you. This is prophetic, and it's for the now, and it's in the future. And it's here it's being told by Moshe, who says the Torah is abrogated and abolished. Somebody who doesn't understand it. This is right here. The plan of redemption. If any of thine be driven out unto the outmost parts of Shemaim of heavens, from there will your God gather thee, and from there he will bring you back to New York.
to the heavens to edit Israel. Right? So none of these have been thoroughly fulfilled. This remains in the future. This day, as foretold here by Moshe in the land of Moab, all Israel and the strangers with them, among them, that there will be a day that he will return them. A day of repentance. And they will come back to what? To Torah. So this is the kind of testimony that we should be seeing right now. People returning to Torah, to repentance, because Yom Hadin is around the corner. It's coming very quickly upon us, keeping his commandments. Moshe is preaching the same gospel, the same Besorah, the same message of redemption, of repentance, spoken by the prophets and spoken by one Jokanandi and Mercer, John the Baptist. Not this Baptist, the one in the Bible. Okay. <laughs> Preach the same gospel, one of repentance, one of return to Torah. I didn't make it up. You can find it. Matthew 3, 2 states. And it reads, Turn from your sins to Hashem, for the kingdom of heaven is near. That is the essence of the gospel. In essence, John is saying, Return. Come back. Make shuva. Because the kingdom is at hand. He's stating the Torah of Moshe. He's not stating anything new. This is totally Torah. The Rambam, in his commentary of this passage, he elaborates and explains that, in essence, the Jew is obligated, is obligated based on this passage to what? He's obligated to admit of the return or, or the coming of the Messiah. They have no choice. The passage is there. The Messiah is coming. And every high holy days after Zechariah, they say, what are they, what are they praying? For Messiah to come. This is why. It's instructed. They know those who have been revealed by the Ruach and our believers in Messiah Yeshua. We'll call it a coming back. And those who have still got the scales, they're still waiting for his coming. Now, there is a prediction upon Israel of a redemption. And it correlates, just like Rambam was stating, it correlates exactly to the prophets on Isaiah 11 and Ezekiel 37. There is that prediction of the rise of a Davidic king, the prediction of one who will rule, and one who will restore the kingdom. Now this was also expressed by none other than our master Yeshua in the book of Acts. Chapter 1 verse 6. When they were referring to, when they were all together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore self-rule to Israel? Listen to this. Are you going to restore rule to Israel? What is the rule of Israel. Anybody know? T-O-R-A-H. Torah. That's the rule of Israel. So, the Master Yeshua is telling the people, that's the restoration of all things. You're going back to Torah. So how can we hasten His return? Go back to Torah. Come back. Repent. Start walking in His uh, obedience to His commandments. It says today, this is something, obviously, that's still pending completely because Yeshua already fulfilled in their first coming only part, but with his giving of his life. So we might still inherit the Olam Haba or the world to come, but he still needs to fulfill this. He resurrected, obviously, uh, removed the curse of sin and death from us, but he has yet to fulfill this. He has yet to ingather all his people from the four corners of the earth. He has yet to rebuild the temple. And he has yet to restore fully the Torah in the land. So, in the beginning of verse 3 here, you read, Hashem Eloha will bring you back from the Galut, from this exile. 
I'm not going to enter now into some eschatological <laughs> debate on rapture this or rapture that. What I'm going to stick here with the Torah is what the prophets and the apostolic writings really speak about is the ingathering of the people. So if you like to use the term rapture, suits you, that's fine. But this is what the Torah Moshe says. They will all be in gather. There will be a day they will all be in gather and they will all be taken into the land. They're not going to be disappearing. They're not going to be going elsewhere. Okay? Now, please listen to me. There is a reason that this phrase is used and maybe it was um, coined by somebody. There's a reason, or this is the season, or the reason for the season. That's what they say, right? But they use a different season. <laughs> Next week is Yom Teruah, right? There is a reason for the season. Yom Teruah, the day of trumpet, Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year, Yom Hadin, all these things. The ingathering of, of his people. Could it be this is the Rosh Hashanah that he does it? Could it be that this is the Rosh Hashanah that the master returns? If it is, he promised all of us that believe in him an all expense trip to Eretz Israel free. And you don't even have to jump in no spaceship. It's but a blink of the eye. Boom, you're there. With your hands like this, Baruch Hashem. See? A lot of people like that, huh? Now they like that. So have an expectation of his coming and come back to the Torah. That's what Moshe is encouraged the people to do. Don't you agree? All right. So it says, Hashem will bring you into what? Into the land, Haaretz, which your fathers possess. See, it's not New York. It's Israel, Canaan. And thou shalt possess it, and he will do thee good and multiply thee above what he did to your fathers. Everything is right here. Prophetic, messianic, in the future. So now, what about this item here? The next time you get up in an argument, about this term here. Thread lightly. It's going to be brought up. This is something you're always going to be kind of, um, let's say, um, engaged with. It's some of the things that sometimes you got to pick your battles. It's not worth it, but you need to know where you stand. Okay? So circumcision is talked about here in the Torah. Because a lot of the times we get told, they say, well, Paul, Rav Shaul, says, you must be circumcised of the heart. You say, Baruch Hashem, where do you think Paul got that from? Anybody? The Torah. <laughs> so agree. Agree in that argument. Yes, I agree with you, brother. Absolutely. Let's go to see where Paul got it from. This Torah portion. Okay. It says, and Hashem Echa will circumcise thy left, your heart, and your heart of thy who? Does anybody know what Sarai is? Your seed. Seed. No. I can go just on the seed for a while because it, 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 you find it here in the Hebrew and it's actually in singular. But anyway, to love Hashem your God with, again, Bekol Levacha, Bekol Nafshecha. With all your heart and with all your being. And here is the kicker. How are you going to live? You have to do the first part. So that you might live. See? So next time you have this argument about circumcision. Oh, physical, spiritual. Remember the concept is found right here in the Torah. He said, listen, that's not new. The sons of Abraham took a covenant. And they marked their bodies with a mark to signify that. But the Torah always said it's about the heart. 
See? Argument over. We've got nothing else to grab. So we need to understand and take that at heart. Why will Moshe here add to the people the expectation of a greater future of circumcision? Circumcision was a symbol, obviously, as I just said, as the covenant with Abraham. But now there is something else introduced here. This is a circumcision of what is known as the circumcision of Messiah. So when they talk to you about, you know, the Torah is not about Messiah. What is your answer? Sanhedrin, just hit him. Sanhedrin 99 says that all the words of the Torah and the prophets is about Messiah. Every Torah portion is about Messiah. The Torah is about Messiah. So you'll see it here. It's telling you exactly that this circumcision talked about Moshe here is the one that Messiah comes. Jeremiah 31, 31. I will not deal with it. I will put a new covenant in them, a covenant like I didn't give to their forefathers, right? A covenant that is put in their I write the Torah in their hearts. That's where it comes from. The covenant of Messiah, the covenant that through his love, Hashem will love his people and the people will be ob obtaining what? Not just any life, eternal life. See, it's much greater, much greater, eternal life. This circumcision of the heart means that a repented heart that we spoke about in the previous light, a heart that is after God's will. And it's explained thoroughly. Now you can take out Rav Shaul out of the pocket or Paul out of the pocket and go to Romans chapter 2. And when you explain it with this context, he explains vividly exactly what you're looking up here. The Rambam goes out to explain, explain that when Messiah comes, he will remove, and this is very interesting, he will remove with this circumcision of the heart the evil inclination from men. So he, in other words, what he paralleled the evil inclination is, let's say in the physical, a sort of foreskin. So he's going to remove the foreskin of the heart, which is the evil inclination from mankind when Messiah comes. Well, I can say I'm into that. I agree that. Because Messiah... It's going to bring all, what, all good things to man who believe in it. It says, he goes on to say, Rambam goes on to say, that removing that foreskin is also removing every lust of this world that is in your heart. Everything that ties you up that is forbidden to Hashem, He will remove it. That at that time, all human beings will return. I think I was talking, I don't know where Eduardo is, Eduardo Jr. I was talking to, about Adam Richon, the original Adam. And, uh, and we were discussing that, right? And we were discussing that, he, and here the sage is telling you, he will basically bring you back to the state that Adam was originally made. And that's what we believe. We believe that Messiah one day will restore all things to the orig original, our original state. Because the first thing it does for those who have died in him, they are what? They are resurrected, right? And it says, the Bible says they're resurrected into what? Immortality. They were reading in the Brita Kadashat today that, hey, Touch me. Touch my wounds. Didn't they read that? Look. Huh? And I can still eat. But I'm here now. And then you don't see me. That's a new body of immortality. That's what he's going to restore you to. That is the promise given here all the way from Torah that one day, one day, Messiah will restore all things. The result will be of all these things is through obedience to Hashem and to His commandments. 
Colossians 2.11 states, and here Rav Shaul again explains this concept. It says, in Mashiach also you were circumcised with the circumcision, the Brit Milah, not made by human hands on the flesh, but the Brit Milah of the surgically removing of the body of the flesh. That correlates directly with the Ramah. Or our falling tendency or our unregenerated uh, nature in the Brit Milah of the Mashiach. You see? The Mashiach is in the business of cutting. Some people don't like that. All of us should be lining up to get cut by the Messiah because that is a covenant. The covenant of blood. He received it in his body and we receive by his blood the what? The connection to the Father and the admission to his kingdom. So Moshe's question for us today is answered by the profound words found in chapter 30, verse 19 and 20. I call on heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have presented you with life and death, the blessing and the curse. Therefore, choose life so that you will live, you and your descendants, loving other than I, your God, paying attention to what he says and clinging to him. For that is the purpose of your life. On this depends the length of time you will live in the land of Adonai, who swore he will give to your ancestors Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. So to all of you, you got but one thing to do. Let's choose life. Amen? Let's stand and pray. Father, thank you. For your word is perfect. Thank you for the promises of your Messiah. Thank you for his life that gives us life. Thank you for the promise of redemption. Father, may we have a heart ready to repent, a heart ready to make sure we return quickly to you. For we know, and I know, we all fall short. But it's through that blood, through that precious blood of Messiah that we come before your holy throne asking for forgiveness for anything that we might have done to transgress against you. Father, as we, if we do so, as we come close to this appointed time here as a cycle comes upon us, may we recognize the season and recognize within ourselves what it needs to be done. May your Ruach come into our lives and teach us and let us know everything that needs to be removed. Everything that needs to be cut out so that we will have access. B'Shem Yeshua, we pray. Amen. Amen. Do the cut. Eloheinu v'elohe avoteinu barakeinu v'baracha hamshul sheshet b'torah hatekel v'al yedei Moshe avdeka. Amura mipi aharonu v'nav kohanim am kedosheka ka'amor. Our God and the God of our fathers, bless us with a threefold blessing written in the Torah by Moshe, your servant, and pronounced by Aaron and his sons, the Kohanim, your holy people, as it is said. Amen. May Adonai bless you and keep you. May it be your will. May Adonai make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May it be your will. And may Adonai turn his face towards you and establish peace for you. May it be your will. Yivarechech Adonai veishmerecha Ken yehi ratzo Yair Adonai panavelecha vichuneka Ken yehi ratzo Yisa Adonai panavelecha v'yasem lecha Shalom Ken yehi ratzo In the name of Yeshua Meshekein Vesa Shalom in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, Shabbat Shalom. Thank you for joining us. Have a great rest of the Shabbat. We look forward to seeing you next Shabbat. And to all, if I don't see you next week or you don't join us next week, Shana Tova. Shana Tova. See you next week.